Hello, we welcome you. This is Ali and I said I'm joined today by Dr. Judy McIntyre of Hopkinton Endodontics, a great colleague and a, a fellow HSDM graduate. Uh, Judy, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So Judy's going to share a couple of cases. Yeah, so, you know, um, we're seeing a lot of different things in endodontics now. And remember, the goal is not just to do a root canal. The goal is to save the tooth, okay. which is so important for not only us to remember, but also our patients to understand. So I've had two different scenarios, carious exposures, but the patient is asymptomatic and the roots are formed and we don't necessarily have to do a root canal on these teeth. Vital pulp therapy, it's the new thing. Exactly, so the AAE put out a position statement so you can read all about it there. But what essentially we're doing is we're taking just a little bit of the pulp off, doing essentially a pulpotomy or partial pulpotomy to the point where you have a controlled situation. You don't have an actively bleeding pulp and then you place some sort of barrier over it and you can either temporize to see tentatively how this plays out short term that it remains asymptomatic and then restore at a later date. Obviously this is the treatment of choice when the apices are open whether there's caries or a traumatic pulp exposure due to trauma. Um, so especially when the teeth have open apices, this is the treatment choice that should be done. Right, because they have younger teeth with the open apices have a better chance of regenerative and kind of uh, being able to kind of fully form that apex. Fully form the apex and also to overcome the insult from caries and other inflammation of the pulp. Absolutely. Okay. And even if, let's say at a later date after that goal of Regendo, regenerative endodontics vital pulp therapy is accomplished and the root has formed, then we have a much better predictable outcome because we have a root apex instead of an open area to the body that we can control, we can better control. Yeah, more bulk to the root, so stronger teeth. Thicker wa dental also walls. Also closer apical construction, so easier seal. Absolutely. You know, a smaller diameter of a circle, that's always better than a larger diameter. So what is your protocol? What do you think? What should we do? So obviously treatment selection is super important. You really, the goal here is asymptomatic teeth with either, you know, small or large carious that gets close to the pulp. It's important to establish that these patients don't have symptoms, cold sensitivity, especially heat sensitivity beforehand. In the trauma case, you usually have a complicated crown fracture or a very, very close to the pulp, uncomplicated crown fracture. And you're going to just take either avoid the pulp or um, take, decide if the exposure has been along to the oral environment and contamination, you're going to take a little bit of that pulp to have a controlled environment and for you to, to get to the point where there's no bleeding in that pulp. So I personally use a small diamond round burr and always a, a fresh diamond round burr, never carbide. And I um, essentially just kind of go in there and start kind of yeah. shave off the pulp um, and when you can see the pulp and see that it's there and red but not actively bleeding that's the point where you can uh, assume that you have healthy pulp so at that point what I do is I take cotton pellets soaked in sodium hypochlorite and I apply gentle pressure for about five minutes on top of this non-hemorrhagic but very vital pulp mm -hmm. and then I Any remove Any concentration of sodium hypochlorite you recommend? I use full strength 5.25%. Okay. Um, I don't know that the literature actually gets that detailed but mm -hmm. yeah so and then what you're going to do is put a bioceramic putty something that is not going to stain especially if these teeth are anterior teeth right remember what you're doing in the goal of everything that you're using and knowing your dental materials and then I'm pretty much putting um, flow or some sort of barrier IRM is fine too and then either temporizing it or you can commit and you can put something like a resin on top of it but you're also very important recalling these patients these patients should not be lost um, otherwise you know any sort of complication can uh, continue to happen you want to make sure that these patients continue to remain asymptomatic and radiographically that the roots remain uh, cont continuing in root development if they're uh, open apices. Yeah, I mean, follow-up is super important in these cases Absolutely. to maintain or rather validate uh, vitality. So let's look at a case that you have. So I have several different cases. 
this case, uh, there was a carious pulp exposure and IRM was placed. We removed the IRM and indicator was used. And then the pulp was amputated with, again, a diamond burr. And then hypochlorite was used with some pressure and cotton pellets. And then once we achieved hem hemostasis on that vital pulp, we placed MTA in this molar and then you can restore however you'd like and then of course you follow up. Um, my other case that I was speaking to you about was a child that had a complicated crown fracture smacked their face into a dresser, advised mom to keep the oral environment clean with hydrogen peroxide, placed over-the-counter dent temp cement, and then saw me the very next morning where I did a vital pulp therapy on these open apices. And I can update you at a future date, but yeah. hopefully the apices will continue to form. And I hope and I, I really do believe that these teeth will remain vital. Terrific. What kind of success rate would you expect from these types of treatments? So again, it's really case selective. We have different types of things that we want to achieve, right? We want it case dependent again. We want to achieve root closure and formation and thicker dentinal walls. We would like for them to continue to remain asymptomatic and for the pulp to remain vital. And then we would like them to, you know, eventually avoid a root canal, but that's not necessarily a negative outcome, right? Depending on where the starting point is. So really depending on all of what your goal, final goal is, um, that's where the success and the definition of success lies. Yeah, yeah, clearly. I mean, they want to be in function and asymptomatic. So what? how do you monitor the symptoms? What kind of symptoms are telltale signs? What, how do you communicate this with the patient? Right, so depending on how much pulp you take away, you might not be able to actually cold test, right? If you do a full pulpotomy down to the orifices, that's just not going to conduct. So in those cases, you're really relying more on the other sensitivity tests, the percussion test, the bite test, the radiograph graphic sign of a bone, uh, you know, a healthy bone or on the scan, because I, I really encourage these cases to, to be scanned. Um, so we're, we're looking for no apical periodontitis, of course. Yeah, you know, we're going to use proxies, obviously, to see if there is, you know, how has the periapex and so on in some cases where you can validate vitality inside the canal. But what is your follow-up regimen? When do you ask the patient to come back? Is, is it at a three-month follow-up? Is it a, a six-month follow-up or all of those, including a year? Excellent question. So I have a, a extensive experience in trauma, right? So the trauma schedule always after a dental trauma is one week, one month, three months, six months, one year, and then once a year for five years. Now, does everybody uh, comply? No, no, not everybody so, complies. Right. And we know what happens when they don't comply, um, unfortunately. However, I like to model that trauma follow-up to the same thing. However, I have a caveat. My caveat is I tell the parents when parents are involved, and I tell the patients patients all the time, call if any symptoms arise, right? Healthy teeth don't hurt ever. Right. right. So number one, everybody has to understand before they leave my office that healthy teeth don't hurt, they should call at any time, they should call me. They shouldn't call their dentist, they should call me. Second is what I like to see, like for example, the, after the patient that I saw this morning, is I would like to see them again in one month. I'll text them next week and hopefully they'll be okay, but they know to communicate with me. I'll see them in one month, I'll see them in three months, depending on how the symptoms are, but after that I'll see them once a year. And then sometimes, especially when a pediatric patient is involved, I'll just ask them, hey, at your next cleaning, take an x-ray, send it to me. Of course, you're missing a lot of information with that, right. but it, you're still getting a lot of information, and from that you can decide whether or not they need to be seen, especially when you add that to, to whether right. or not they're having symptoms. That's personally what I do. Yeah, so last question also, that we know that as we said, vital pulp therapy, it works better in younger patients because of the, you know, literally the vitality and perfusion of the pulp and the uh, space that we're dealing with. Do you have a cutoff time for the age? Is there something that is limited to a certain younger patients? Is there something you want to try in older patients as well? I don't 
really have a cutoff for age, but generally, right, if the canals are calcified, if the if there's a lot of dentistry on the tooth, it's probably not going to be a successful treatment choice for one to choose and try to pursue. Um, when there's a lot of sclerotic dentin, a lot of calcified canals, the pulp is pretty much at a point where, if right. you think about it objectively, it just can't really repair and heal. Yeah, I mean, I think part of the issue here is for people to understand is that we all also count on pulp's immune capability to address any of the you know tiny bit of microbes that may be still left behind during our carrier's excavation and disinfection so that it could recover. And the more fibrotic and less vascular the pulp is, its ability to defend itself is also compromised. So therefore it's going to have uh, more of a difficulty in terms of recovering. Also, of course, larger decay, as you get cervical decay in these kinds of patients right. and in older patients that causes it. So this is terrific. Thanks so much for sharing this case and your expertise and awesome. uh, best of luck. I think it's an exciting area of an endo uh, with vital pulp therapy and I think uh, we're going to have to work out a proper and best uh, protocol for it over time. I'm sure things are going to be a, a lot clearer. Awesome. But thanks for sharing your experience. Thank Shop, you. Uh, Dr. Judy uh, uh, McIntyre from uh, Hopkinton Endodontics and uh, we'll leave a contact area for you down there as well. Until then, for Real Dendo, I'm Alan. I said I was joined by Dr. Judy McIntyre for Hopkinton Endodontics and until the next video, let's save some teeth.